Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. I know Ken Scamble is talking right next door and he's awesome. So uh, for the people that showed up, I appreciate it. Uh, this uh, sort of talk is, is in two parts. Uh, this, this kind of talk is the motivational. I t talk to you about the basic shape of things and then the workshop will go nitty gritty into things. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about me. Uh, as was said before, I work at the Queensland Functional Programming Lab and it's my job to sort of help FP succeed and give local businesses a competitive advantage by allowing them to adopt FP in any way that I can. So teaching them, making libraries better, uh, removing roadblocks. Uh, oops, I'm one ahead. Uh, and I'm a web app guy. So uh, I, my, my sort of personal mission at QFBL is to sort of make full stack Haskell app development awesome. Because uh, I really love building software that's tangible, it's pretty, can have colors, uh, and it improves people's lives and it, they interact with it in a very human way. I really love that, but it sucks. Even with the best of breed tools, it's a pain. Uh, and call me a sort of zealot, uh, but I, I've had a lot of success with sort of hitting really hard problems with sort of fundamentally sound, haskell pure things. So let's, let's talk about reflex. Now, reflex is a sort of uh, very overloaded term for an entire ecosystem, and the word can kind of mean many things. So I'll sort of enumerate them all uh, so that we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, the first thing is reflex, which is the base sort of FRP library, which is, when I say FRP, I mean functional reactive programming. And really what that means is it gives us a fundamental structure for sort of programming uh, over time varying state. So uh, in, a, in an event source world, You've got values and they change over time as events flow into your system. FRP gives us a, a language, a DSL, to model this. Uh, and it is web agnostic. So if you don't care about web and you want to do other things, uh, you can pick it up and do other things. Uh, if you don't want to do web front ends, that's cool. Uh, you can still do FRP if you think this is cool. So Reflex DOM is the DOM building sort of framework built on top of Reflex and GHCJS, which is a compiler from Haskell code down to JavaScript, uh, which works really, really well. Later on, it's probably going to compile down to WASM, but right now, we're still targeting JavaScript. Uh, so that's kind of the state of play at the moment. And then there's Reflex Platform, which is sort of a, it's a framework on top of Reflex DOM that gives us a very sort of React Native-like thing. Uh, with the same UI, you can deploy to your browser, you can deploy to iOS, you can deploy to Android. Um, ooh, typo. Um, but it, it's kind of like React Native, but it brings its own advantages with the way that sort of Reflex works, and there's more native code running on your device rather than JavaScript. So it's cool in its own right, but we won't talk about that too much. Then there's Obelisk, which is sort of a full stack framework built on top of the platform. Uh, there's a lot of batteries included. You've got server-side rendering. You've got routing, both in the back end and the front end. And you've got deployments. Uh, and if you're learning Reflex, it's really best to start here. Uh, it's just an easy way to get started. Everything's there. It works. It's really nice. Uh, and that's where the workshop's going to start. So we're going to be doing an obelisk thing. So I guess, why should you care about this? UIs are hard. They're sort of Obviously, they're, they're often very tangled messes of time varying state. And I kind of built up this opinion over a while that even our best of breed tools, like sort of Redux and Elm, they sort of fear and sort of centralized state in this big special place that is monolithic to the whole app. Uh, and to me, that feels very anti modular. I want to build widgets that can have their own time varying state and they can talk to each other in synchronized state and that to not be scary. Uh, and FRP gives us that fundamental way to sort of model that time varying state into the very essence of our program. So it's, it's not an afterthought, it's not this special place over to the side. It's in the core of our programs and you can't escape it. You can't cheat, which is good. It's a very Haskell-y way of being and it's exciting. Um, and I, I, just, I just feel that this, this fundamental jump is critical for us as our programs have become more and more distributed. Uh, things are getting crazy these days. You deploy a web app that's a couple of pages and it's 20 servers and it's got mobile clients and they have to sync all their data up and it just, 
it's getting crazier and crazier and our tools are not evolving. Uh, so I really would like them to evolve. But FRP is really hard to learn. And I'd kind of say that the, the jump from imperative to functional programming, the, the, the jump from FP to FRP is probably the same kind of magnitude. So it's pretty tricky. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sort of, it's really hard to re rewire your brain and sort of you be in the fundamentals and sort of relate that to how you got to code. It feels like you have to relearn programming again. And that's hard. We all sort of did that with FP. Uh, and that was a challenge, but sort of patience sort of persevered and let us charge on and ultimately win. Uh, so my talk goals are sort of to get you past that pain, uh, make it so that you don't have to have so much patience and uh, sort of a, it's not so much a leap of faith. Uh, so the, the goal is to skip you ahead, sort of we'll look at a non-toy application uh, that is a bit meaty. Uh, it's got Ajax calls, it's got logins, it's got uh, sort of local storage, uh, routing, all the kind of things that you would find in your app, it's there. So it's not a toy, it's not to do MVC. It feels real. Um, and I, I, the, the, the goal of the workshop is to also ground these things in sort of language and settings that feel familiar. So we're going to talk about sort of redox reduces and dispatches and subscriptions to try and sort of relate the weird FRP world to some the things that we're actually familiar with to make it a bit easier. But ultimately, it's to sort of un, it's to motivate you to play, learn more. Uh, you're not going to come to my workshop and be an expert in the hour and a half and be writing apps uh, tonight. That's not going to happen. But hopefully, with it sort of slowly progressing through something that's actually real and you can play with later, it might sort of help you move forward if uh, you're interested in doing so. All right, so let's talk about a fundamental building block of FRP, or not FRP, but the reflexes flavor of FRP. Uh, and it's a thing called Foldine. And it's really the reducer of the reflex world. Ah, cool, nice big screen. So uh, when you look at this, it's kind of, I've got these box diagrams in the workshop and the talks just to kind of give you a feel, a graphical feel, so that we can start thinking about FRP as a graph of connecting Lego blocks, because that's really how it is. The, 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 the trick, the, the thing that you have to learn and get in your brain is thinking about these things as circuits that can be switched and wired up and all that kind of thing. So hopefully these diagrams help. Uh, so we have our reducer function, which uh, brings in the event. So we, we, nothing changes in our fold dine world unless we have an event fire in here. And when, when the event fires in there, we have the event, we have the old state, and the job of this function is to produce a new state. Uh, we have an initial value here, so our dynamic has to start with a value. Uh, and then the ultimate result of this is a dynamic. So a dynamic is a, it's a value that has, an event is something that fires, and it fires at discrete points in time. So you click a button, it fires. You click a button, it fires. A dynamic always has a value. So it's going to start at this, and then accumulate state on each event fire. So that's the fundamental difference. Uh, between dynamics and events. Uh, the dynamics is where you accumulate your state. It's where you hold the list of things that you've loaded from the back end. Uh, it's where you count how many times a button's been clicked, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and here, uh, that's going to be awful, isn't it? Can't read that off the back, right? It's a bit bad. No, you can't? Yeah. That's OK. I'll talk it through. Um, so, if we look, let's just focus on the code. Is the code legible? So the code's good. Forget about the diagram. Think about it in, as a basic sort of picture, but we won't talk about the details. Uh, so let's say we want to make a, a, a little widgety thing that is going to, it has a button, it, has the, it says click me, uh, and it's going to have an event that fires every time you click it. Uh, we are going to create a reducer, which just ignores the event that happens, because there's nothing actually useful in this event. It's just a unit value, because there's no interesting thing about a clicking on a button. So we drop that value. It doesn't matter. And our reducer is simply just the old value plus one. 
we're just incrementing the number. Uh, and then we apply our fold dyne to our reducer. We start the number at zero and then use our something that should be button click E uh, to, we, we link that together. And that, that's what this diagram in general is sort of uh, talking about up here. This is the reducer function. It gets plugged into there. Uh, we have our button event flowing into this event and we have our initial value of zero flowing in here. And then our, uh, a dynamic that is the result of this folding, uh, which is this guy here, uh, is displayed. So that's just taking a, a dynamic of anything that can be shown and printing it to the DOM. So the, the interesting thing about this, this example here is that we're interleaving two different sort of modes of programming. We've got a building of the DOM, so we're adding text nodes here, uh, and that inherently has an ordering because we're, we need to add the button before we do the text or whatever we need to do. Um, so there's that, and then there is what this wiring of sort of FRP things as well. Uh, so the, the one thing that the workshop will get, it's weird when you look at it, but it will sort of take time to absorb, uh, is just this intermingling of creating your FRP network of, of time varying state and intermingling the building of the DOM within it. Um, but we don't have to just do boring reducers like this. Uh, we can do things in a fairly cool. We can do things in a way that uh, composes a lot better by these are going to be useless. Uh, I went back. Cool. Uh, so what our events have a we can use monoid append. Uh, is there anybody in this room that hasn't sort of seen monoids and append and sort of MMT and stuff in Haskell land? It's okay if not, because it's a good thing to talk through it. Uh, yep, cool. So th this thing is a, think of it as an append operation. We've, we've got two things and we're sort of gluing them together. There are some laws about how that appending has to work. Uh, so we, we're using that append function to say, I've got two event streams. I've got one of the add clicks thing. So I've got events for doing my addition. And I've got one stream event of events that is just resetting uh, that thing to zero. And we're using the pen to just join them together. Uh, this endo thing here, if you haven't seen monoids, is it's a function from int to int. Uh, and because it's wrapped up, that this thing here can work on it. Uh, so and we can build and build this up. We don't have to do dumb reducers that sort of work how uh, you would see sort of more in, in, re in sort of redux land where you're doing sort of actual sort of functions. We can go over lists of events and just merge and zip them together. Uh, this is the kind of abstractions that we can have. Um, and then there is sort of the, the, the sort of, there's more stuff that you can build on top of this. Um, and the thing that I really, and it sort of ties into the, the niceness that you get out of Redux. When you have a really big app in Redux, the real nice thing that Redux gives you is the ability to dispatch an event from anywhere and subscribe to an event uh, in whatever part of the tree of the UI you're in and not have to pass all of that state down and not have to bubble all of those events up. Redux gives you that nice way of sort of, it centralizes the state, and that's a thing that I have a sort of bit of an issue with, but it, it tidies up the manual passing of things, which makes it a lot easier to refactor your UI, rejig re things, uh, and sort of, it makes it easy to reuse things uh, because you don't have to worry about what context it's in because it can kind of just zoom into the context that it needs. Uh, and be more modular. Um, so in Reflex, we have a thing called Event Rider, and it's really the uh, sort of analog to Dispatcher. So what we can do here um, is we can so we sort of refactor our buttons out into WGD things. Uh, and when we say a WGD thing, we sort of mean it's this weird kind of context that we don't really know much about. We don't have a concrete of idea of what type it is. Um, but what we do know about it is that at each step of this process, it can build DOM elements. Uh, it, that's something that we know that it can do. 
Uh, and we also know that it can write events of this endo thing that we saw before. So this is a function from int int. Uh, what this widget is saying is that I don't really care about the concrete context that I'm running in, but I need you to be able to do these two things for me. Uh, and that gives you a really sort of nice way of just depending on exactly what you need to build your widget without depending on too much, making your code harder to reuse. Uh, and if we look at it here, we, we, we create our button as usual. We get the event out. And then we have this thing here called tell event. And tell event is what plugs into this constraint up here. Uh, don't worry about that too, don't worry about the details of the type classes too much here. Uh, if you just get the general thought that these are constraints on this context that we don't have a concrete idea about, that's enough. Uh, and it'll be enough for the workshop. So if you are still a bit puzzled of what these type classes are, don't worry, we should be able to sort of cargo cult things along in the workshop enough. Uh, and yeah, then we just returning our plus one and our const as before. Um, and running this thing is pretty easy. Uh, and th but the good thing about this is this code actually probably doesn't matter too much. It could be, but the, the thing that really matters is that this, this running of the thing could be 10 things up in the tree, or it could be the parent. Uh, it doesn't matter. You could build up widgets that just had exactly these same constraints. They, they didn't really care about the event. They didn't have a concrete idea of it. Uh, and they could just compose and compose and compose until that eventual parent node that actually cared about the concrete representation uh, sort of is there and can be run. And that's what we're doing here. This is really boring and contrived because it's just running the event writer on top of the widgets that we already wrote. Uh, but even then, that, that kind of makes these buttons a bit more reusable, even if it feels pretty contrived. Uh, and then once, once we run the event writer, we get our event out before, as we did before. So this is an endo of int. So it's a thing that takes an int and returns a new int. Uh, and then we can just fold down it as per normal. Um, the sort of analog to this, and it's, sort of, it's where sort of Redux and subscriptions happen, uh, is Reader T. Uh, so if you've done any, Reader T isn't something that's reflex specific. It's just an MTL thing that you might have done in sort of Haskell backends or whatever Haskell code you've been doing. Um, but when we, when we have a context which is, how am I doing for time? Uh, when we have a context here, so say we wanted to change our button, that it needs to now pay attention to what the count is, because when the count is zero, we want to disable the button. Uh, it's a pretty normal thing that you might want to do in your UI. Uh, we, can, we can sort of, in the same way that we uh, wrote our event writer sort of constraints, where we, we don't really know the concrete thing that we're dealing with here, but we know we want, need it to do these four things. Uh, we can add this monad reader with dynamic t int, which gives us that time sort of varying value of whatever the count is currently. Uh, and we can ask the context for that. So really what monad reader gives us is this ability to ask in this do block. Uh, and this, this pulls out the dynamic of int. Uh, and then we can, we can map over it, check whether it's 0, turn it into a dynamic of bool. Uh, and then we have a sub-widget, which I've omitted, just because it's pretty ugly and won't fit on the slide, uh, which builds a button that if the bool that you give it here is false, uh, it is true, it will put a class of disabled uh, on the button so it won't be clickable. Uh, and then everything else works as normal. So we, we, we introduce this little thing here. It just adds this one little thing to our context. Uh, brings this one little bit in, but the rest is the same. Uh, and all our all callers need to do now is add this little thing of being able to subscribe to this int. Uh, running it kind of looks like what it did before. Uh, it's a bit more gnarly now because we now actually have a, a cycle in the graph. Uh, but it's the same pattern. Uh, if, we, if we take these children that have this sort of a monad reader and event writer constraint, we can make it concrete by sort of running it, peeling it off, 
uh, and then sort of passing what it needs into it. Don't worry about the details of this. This is what will go into the workshop and sort of figure out. Uh, this is just more looking at this and going, that's not really that ugly. Uh, it's, it's difficult because there's some sort of complexity there, uh, but it's not super ugly to sort of weasel these abstractions in and make your widgets a bit more composable and reusable. Um, and these, these sort of abstractions are classy MTL friendly as well. So what we did back here is we are we, uh, depending on sort of very precise types here, uh, which means that our parent, if whatever reader it has, it, it is just an int. It can't have any additional context. We're forcing it to be sort of a concrete thing. Uh, it is possible with this style of programming to add additional constraints here to say, I have a monad reader. It has some state. And I don't really care what the state is, but it has to have the int that I care about in it. Uh, and that is something that we can do, which I'm not putting in the slides because we're doing a half an hour thing and then moving on to the workshop. Uh, but I just find that really cool, being able to build up your UIs with that kind of um, specificity into what the, the widget means and what it needs to do its job. Uh, it just means that I can go and look at this thing and know exactly what it needs, exactly what it can do. So I know that this is not doing any uh, Ajax calls. I know that this thing is not doing any I.O. that could be going off to JavaScript. It is a really nice thing to see here. Uh, but it's still a thing that exists as a member, sort of a, a thing that can exist in this world of time varying state. It's not something that we have to go off and put into the Redux store. It, it is this stateful thing that is subscribing to these things and can exist on its own right, uh, which I think is really, really cool. And it's why I get excited about this. Cool. And there's really lots more, uh, but I don't want to sort of talk about it too much, in, even in the workshop. As far as the workshop goes, this is what we're going to focus on. Uh, so not, not anything too much harder than this. It does build up, and it gets more dense because there's just more stuff going on. Um, but that is the sort of uh, complexity of the abstractions. It's not going to get too crazy from that point onwards. Um, but there is so much stuff that Obsidian are doing. Obsidian, the company that made sort of Reflex and all the stuff behind it, uh, they have so much crazy stuff of they've got a Reflex thing that's like Relay, where it, you can it's subscribing to to backend data, like a widget can say, I care about user A uh, and subscribe to updates on user A and get those changes like piped down specifically to that widget. Not having to have a magic store like Relay or anything like that, just being able to build these things as islands on their own right uh, and being able to compose them together and have it all work, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, because we only have 1.5 hours, uh, I want it to not be a rush. Uh, and I think it's going to be more about talking through things than it is going to be people just charging off uh, and being able to do it all themselves. It's going to be sort of an interactive, longer talk, uh, almost, with some sort of bits where you go off and figure things out and ask questions. Um, you definitely won't leave sort of an expert, but hopefully you'll have fun. And it'll feel like the kind of front-end web that you're used to doing, and it'll sort of motivate you to sort of learn more and ground it into things that interest you. And you might get ideas for running off and making a reflex app. And that's really the goal. So let's just quickly talk about the workshop before we sort of end things off. Uh, it's as if anybody has sort of five minutes. If anybody has dealt with the real-world conduit thing, it's sort of. It's a micro-blogging kind of demo app that is a lot nicer than to do MVC because it's actually got back-end calls and uh, some stuff that you actually want to put in your app rather than just a checklist. Um, so it really sort of gives Reflex a good workout of things that you're going to have to do if you decide to want to, you want to pick up Reflex and make a real thing with it. Um, and it's right after lunch. It's not in here. Uh, it's in the red room. So, but I will be set up in there. Uh, because to do the workshop, you're going to need a functioning sort of Nix Obelisk environment. I don't. It was in the talk abstract, but 
a lot of people seem to have not found the information that was there. So if that is a surprise to you, uh, that you're going to need some stuff uh, to come into the workshop, then just come find me. I've got things on USB drives that will be, as long as you have VirtualBox, you'll be able to get a VM and run with it. Um, if you have the time to do it over lunch and you want to run with it without downloading a VirtualBox thing, if VirtualBox doesn't work for you, uh, then the setup instructions are in the program. Just realize that if you're going the next route, it's even the next route, which is small, is like 700 megs of downloads. Uh, so do it early rather than right before the workshop. Cool. Uh, yeah, and I'll be in there. I sort of will skip lunch, and if anybody needs help to set things up, it'll be better to go in there then than do it all in the workshop, take up that time. Uh, the end.